Good morning. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the deacons especially uh, for allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, it's a, a privilege and an honor and a blessing to share Christ with others. Uh, I don't take that lightly and I don't take it for granted. So deacons uh, and church as a whole, I, I thank you for that. Um, anytime I do get up here, can you all hear? Kind of hear? Sort of hear? Doesn't matter if you hear, all right. Um, I do get nervous. You know, a lot of people think, oh, he doesn't get nervous. We'll get him to do it. But I, I get nervous, uh, whether I'm praying or speaking or making an announcement. And uh, it almost never fails. I think of a story that Everett Burnett shared a few years ago. Uh, this family lived down in the bayous of Louisiana. Didn't have running water. So uh, the family would take a bucket down to the creek, draw the water, bring the water back to the house, and they'd have water. So one morning, Mama sent the little boy out and uh, said, son, go down the creek and get us some water. I said, all right. So the little boy goes down the creek and he dips his bucket in the creek and just as he does, this old gator pops his head up. The little boy drops his bucket, runs back to the house. Runs inside, his mom said, what's the matter with you? He said, mama. I said, I dipped my bucket in the water in the creek to get the water and said, this old gator popped his head up. So I dropped my bucket, ran all the way back to the house. She said, now son, listen to me. I said, I done told you that gator's as scared of you as you is of him. And the little boy looked at his mom and said, well, if that's the case, that water ain't fit to drink anyhow. <laughs> so uh, I will get nervous. I'll stop sometimes. You'll wonder, why is he stopping? I'm probably just lost my spot. So just bear with me. But uh, the message I'm going to share with you this morning is not about salvation. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is the Christian life and, and how to feel God's presence in your life, hopefully. Uh, but it is not a salvation issue that I'm going to touch on this morning. Uh, if any of you are here and you don't know Jesus and you want to know more about Jesus or you do have come to know Jesus and you want to uh, claim him as your Savior, by all means, at the end, come down front. Uh, I or one of the deacons, someone will talk to you and, and we'll get you going. Um, you know, the Bible says, I think it may pop up up there and it may not, but the Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and that is far better than anything I could share with you this morning. Uh, so, at the end of the service, you'll have an opportunity to take care of that. There it is. Told you to be there. But uh, what I am going to share with you this morning, uh, some of you may not know that uh, Robert McDowell's grandson-in-law and my cousin are the same person. And that person is Dwayne Morrison. And uh, he was the inspiration for our message this morning. And I would imagine that Dwayne has not inspired many sermons, uh, but something that I believe and will continue to believe is that brilliance is the ability to take a great truth and express it in as few words as possible. Um, but before I, I share with you Dwayne's truth, I've got to give you a little background information. Uh, something else you may not be aware of. Gentlemen, at least in the South, are not allowed in phone conversations with the word bye. Now, the first time I noticed this, I was a little old fellow. I was at my grandfather's house, and he'd be talking to somebody on the phone, and he'd get finished, and he'd say, oh, hey, all right, hey, hey, hey. And I, okay. So a few years later, I had a cousin of mine that hit puberty before I did. And we'd be talking on the phone, and we'd finish, and I'd say, all right, bye, Bubba. He'd say, yeah, see you, man. Well, okay. So anyway, I finally figured out that, that you don't say bye. You say see you, you say later, you say something, but men don't say bye. So, back to Dwayne. Every phone conversation I've ever had with him that I recall ends the same way. You know, I'm, hey, see you, man, because I've learned too. And then he says, all right, be good, boy. And that's it, and he hangs up. So, that, beloved, is our message for today. Be good. So, please pray with me. Gracious God, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray that my words would be your words and that what I say would be in accordance with your will and your way. Open our hearts and our minds. Help us to hear what you would have us to hear. To come here for your message and not for mine. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, surely to goodness Ryan could come up with something better than be good. Doesn't he know that Jesus teached and preached for three years and people have been preaching for 2,000 years ever since? Doesn't he know the Bible is over a thousand pages long, spoken directly to us from God above? Doesn't he know that real preachers go to seminary for years to learn about the Bible? Yeah, I know all that. But when you get down to the fundamentals, to the basics of Christianity and what we believe and what we should do, it is be good. 
So that is our message this morning. Be good. So let's, let's just look at those two words to begin with. Good's pr pretty easy. We all kind of get good, right? Um, scripture tells us in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And in Deuteronomy 14, 1, it tells us, you are the children of the Lord your God. Now, if we are children of God, then God is in us. Just as I have my dad's height and my mom's allergies, there's a part of God in me. As Christians, we believe in a three-part God. We believe God the Father. He's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He's everywhere. Jesus was God that came to earth. And the Holy Spirit is the third part of that God. And that's the God that lives in us, just as the Bible told us. Now, what I've always been fascinated about with this Holy Spirit aspect is how similar, rather than different, all religions around the world are. The Comanche Indians of the American West worship a Father God that lives in the sky. The Yanomami, uh, African or uh, Amazonian rainforest people, they believe in a hell that is in the underworld. Hindus, Buddhists, all have eternal life beliefs to some degree or another. So these far-flung and unacquainted religions are similar because the Holy Spirit is in humans. Not just in us, but in all humans. These truths that tell us what it means to be good, kindness, honesty, loyalty, trustworthiness, charity, are all characteristics of being good. We understand good because God is good and God is in us. And we can worship God with our lives when we be good. Proverbs 21.3, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So good is pretty easy. B is a little tough. And I think Charlene went to the children's church. That's good. She's an English teacher. She'd probably get on me for this next part. But anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle B the best I can. And uh, speaking of not being a great student, uh, I was not a great student. But uh, I did remember Spanish class, and one of the, the most fascinating things to me about Spanish was they have two words for our word to be. And I know Josephine's here. I saw her earlier. I don't see her right now. There you are. Right, am I correct? We've got two words in Spanish, ser and estar. Now, estar is temporary. You know, I am happy. I am hungry. Those type things. Ser we use, or they use, for a permanent feeling or a permanent way of being, something that defines you, the fabric of who you are. You know, I am a male. I am from South Carolina. And when we talk about be good as a Christian, we're talking about good defining who we are. You know, going beyond just one project or one thought, but it is, gets to the fundamental principle of who we are as individuals. Um, again, turning to scripture to support all of this, James 1.22 uh, tells us, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Being good is a way we can worship God with our bodies and our lives. By doing good and becoming good, we become more and more like God our Father. Now the problem with all of this, it, it is very hard to do, right? But if we think of our lives as a living offering to God, we can get the strength we need to do this. Now, I love America, amen? Amen. Part of what I love about America is we celebrate success and we celebrate excellence. And if you achieve success or you achieve excellence, we even have a name for that. And we call you a star, right? Rock star, pop star, sports star, all kind of stars running around here. Today, I encourage us as a congregation to become Christian stars, to live our lives, our Christian lives, to such an extent that we are stars for Christ. So let's think about stars, nighttime stars, not rock stars. What do they really do? They just show up every day or every night and do exactly what they're supposed to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Part of what makes them so special, I think, anyway, is that they're always where they're supposed to be and they're always doing what they're supposed to be doing. NASA even tells us that stars that burned out years and years ago are still sending their light to Earth. 
How many of us want our light to shine beyond our death? How many of us want to honor God by the lives that we live? How many of us want to feel that God is not only with us, but in us? So how can we become stars? S-T-A-R. Speech, thought, and responses. So let's start with speech, the first one, the S of star. Speech is likely the easiest way for us to be stars, Christian stars. We have complete control over anything and everything that comes out of our mouths. We can use it to uplift and to build up and to praise, or we can use it to not do those things. The Bible warns us in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. How can we honor God through our speech? Encourage those around you. Vow to give three compliments per day. Do not listen to gossip or participate in gossip. <laughs> Sing songs, say prayers. Okay, we have complete control over our speech. We can use it for praise or for sin. If we want to be a star for God, we need to be good in our speech. Thoughts. So we got ST, thoughts. These are, in my opinion at least, the most difficult to control. According to the University of Southern California, the average person has 70,000 thoughts per day. Put that in perspective, that is one thought for every seat in Panther Stadium every single day of your life. These thoughts are random, often involuntary, and easily influenced by outside forces. Two of those outside forces that as a parent and as someone who's getting older by the day worry about is music and television. As Christians, we must be aware that our society is becoming digitally dependent. Our children are listening to a lot of music, watching a lot of TV, spending time on a lot of smart stuff. Okay? Now, I am getting older, and I'm not as cool as I used to be. But I do think that our thoughts are influenced negatively by some of these devices. Not always, not in every case. I'm not, not ranting and railing against that. But we do have to be careful. So I'm going to share a thought with you. You guys know me by now. Anytime I point out how not to do things, I try to use myself as an example. So ninth grade, going on an overnight field trip, Washington, D.C. Okay? I get word that some of my classmates are bringing Boone's farm wine. Okay? Now, Praise God, I had wonderful parents that raised me and taught me not to do that stuff. Had great teachers taught me, Ryan, don't do that. It's wrong. You don't need it, son. Okay? I made the choice. Before we left Rock Hill, I was not going to drink wine and party on this field trip. Okay? I did it. It was done. No worries. So, we get on the bus, eight-hour bus ride up to Washington, D.C. Somebody has the Hank Williams Jr. box set. Okay, me and Hank sing about getting whiskey bent, and we sing about all my rowdy friends, and we sing about uh, Born to Boogie, sing all these songs, okay? Those songs became my thoughts, those thoughts influenced my actions, and when it came time that night at the hotel to break out the Boone's Farm, guess who was sitting right there with them? Okay? I accepted responsibility then, I accept it today. It was wrong. Shouldn't have done it. I knew better. But 20 years later and 20 years wiser, there's not a doubt in my mind that my thoughts that were influenced by that music on that bus ride changed who I was. Okay? Now, I wasn't perfect to begin with, but now I had decided at least on this trip I was going to be good. So we've got to be aware. Okay? I'm not, not going to go any further, but just be aware of those kind of things. So Romans 12:2 tells us, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be a star for God if we spend each day in prayer or meditation. We can turn the radio off on the way to work, dwell on our blessings. We can be stars if we push out thoughts of lust, revenge, hate, greed, and dishonesty the moment we become aware of them. Finally, we'll wrap up thoughts with Philippians 
Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our final one, we've got speech, thought, and responses. Responses or actions. Obviously, responses work better with my little analogy there. Um, this one here, again, back to James chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Uh, it says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Galatians encourage us to be good. In chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. James warns us of the dangers of not being good. Uh, chapter 4, verse 17. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, sins. So does the world know that you are a Christian because you tell them or because you show them? Do your kids know what a healthy and respectful marriage looks like? When crises or problems arise, how do you respond? Less than one month ago, a young man shot and killed nine church members in Charleston. Newspaper writers wrote that he was evil. Television news anchors called him a racist. Governments removed flags and renamed state parks. The shooter's own family disowned him. The surviving church members forgave him. The surviving church members prayed for him. The surviving church members held life celebrations for those who were killed. The surviving church members are stars for God. If we want to feel closer to God, if we want to see God change and improve our world, we need to be good. Be good to your neighbor, be good to your family, be good to the earth. Our God loves us and he created us, the Bible says, to honor and glorify him. He wants us to be stars, speech, thought, and responses. So how do we do that? It's easy. Go to funerals. Teach a Wednesday night lesson. Kiss your spouse. Discipline your children. Give blood for the sick. Stand up for the weak. Opportunities abound each and every day to be good. Recommit to living your life for God and not for earthly gain. Now being a star for God is going to alienate you from some of your friends. It's going to challenge your self-discipline. At some point you're going to question, is it worth it at all? Okay? Lean on your fellow believers. Pray for energy, discipline, conviction, stamina. Whatever you need, put it on God's plate. Take it off of yours. If you do these things, your life will be a living offering for God. And your light will burn bright long after your walk through this world has ended. At this time, we're going to do, where'd it go? The benediction hymn, is that correct? Uh, Psalm 153, Lily of the Valley. And again, I'll be down front. Anybody has any questions, concerns, wants to accept Jesus, wants to find out more about Jesus, please come, guys. It's the most important decision you can ever make. It's, you know, that's all I can say. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Paris.
Christ of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tar. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. Of my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach my goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. This morning I have offered you only words. I hope they've inspired you or guided you or at least given you pause to think. But if you want to see Be Good Lived Out, you need to look no further than right behind me. Miss Bobby McCoy has been good for, we won't say how long, but by being good she's inspired others, including me, to try to be better. So, Grandmama, will you close us in prayer please? Amen. Thank you.